Okay, hi everyone. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the cat screensaver. All of those cats are from a shared folder at Stripe where we all post pictures of our cats. So real people own those cats. Uh, so, to, so I'm based in our Singapore office out here. We're working on uh, payments in the Asia Pacific region. And I'm gonna talk today about a uh, survey of different ways that we do really cool things that you might have learned in your college classes across all of our, um, all of our teams actually. We're gonna cover quite a bit of material. Uh, and I like to, I, I really want to cause like the, when am I ever going to need this talk? Because when I was in college, I, I kept thinking like, seriously, like, why are we doing this? It's, it doesn't make sense. I just want to do like real, th real coding. And I realized all of those things I was learning in like, compilers and like algorithms class were actually very relevant. So uh, let me explain who I am, uh, just so you have a little more context on, on me. I am class 2015, so I'm not that much uh, older than you guys. I hope I don't seem that old. I... In high school, I actually was like afraid of math. I like, didn't really, I, want, I thought I wanted to do engineering, but I was like not sure if I could like handle it, I guess. Um, and then I almost didn't do computer science because I thought it was gonna like require a ton of math. So, I mean, I think f over time I started learning about things like the growth mindset and like realizing that like you really do have to just practice and like do a lot of exercises in order to uh, get better at things like this. It's not just like about being smart. Um, I failed algorithms. I really wanted you all to know that because I don't. I didn't want to sound like I was like some kind of like crazy genius that was like constantly acing all my classes. I failed a ton of classes, including algorithms. Had to take it twice. I think I still got a B in the second time, so I didn't even do that well the second time around. But the point is, I still understand all these things, and you all can too. <laughs> One time, I freaked out. I had to like write a reference <coughs> search for a work project, and I was like, no way, this is ever going to be relevant. Like, why would I ever need to do reference search? And then I had to write. Uh, I had to use D3.js to like write a visualization of a bunch of nodes, and I had to like highlight some paths <coughs> on it, along it. So I wrote a BFS in JavaScript, and it was great. And then I got to like go email my algorithm teacher. Like it happened, it came true. <laughs> um, and so I have a job. You know, again, I'm trying to make this like as accessible as possible. None of this stuff is going to be like so crazy complicated or like over the top that like you can't like go get a job in industry and go do it like right away. So I feel obligated to explain what Stripe is in case any of you uh, don't know what we do. We're not a customer, a consumer facing company, so I get that um, it's okay if you don't know what we do. Um, so our stated mission is increase the GDP of the internet. I don't know what GDP is. I could not even tell you what it stands for. I, I, we throw it around a lot. I think it, I, I think it means like how much money a nation has. I'm like looking back at the Stripe people to like see if they're gonna nod at me. No, yes, no. Yeah, so I think that, I think our mission is like to the companies like we have a so we have this magazine we've done a bunch of issues on like security on incident management and a bunch of other really great topics. The one that we have out here for you all today is the programming languages one and just like how companies think about which languages they should be writing in. Um, so that's one example of like something we've done just to help people start and like maintain their businesses. Um, another uh, the whole whole suite of start products are all like pretty. Uh, pretty much like related to that idea. So we have like, for example, helping people do uh, marketplaces. So that's like, if you have like Grab or Deliveroo, that's like a customer, one of us, paying a driver or a delivery person or a restaurant. So um, how do you move money between two sets of people while also like taking a cut because you're Grab or Deliveroo and you want to make money off of that? Terminal would be our point of sale system. So you know, you're physically in a store, you want to like pay with a credit card and you can like punch in your pin. Uh, payments, obvious. We help people process credit cards with our sweet API. Uh, issuing, we help people uh, like use an API to programmatically create car debit cards that you can like hand out to your drivers, for example. Sigma, that's data analysis. You know, you can kind of use something that's vaguely SQL-esque to analyze your business data, so we can help you get insights. Radar, we're going to talk about that a lot in this talk. It's going to be about like fraud detection and doing machine learning to make sure that people are not using your platform for bad things. Then we like to call us the Global Payments and Treasury Network because we're here in Singapore, we're going global, we're trying to help people accept payments all over the world across like any kind of currency, which actually I guess we're not, uh, we're not quite there yet. I mean, for example, if you're like, in Australia, you might only be able to like, accept Australian dollars. Maybe one day in the future, we want you to accept any kind of currency across the whole planet and lots and lots of payment methods beyond credit cards. So I like to start with what I'm going to uh, end with. So I'll, I'll tell you what the lessons are and then you can like reflect on them throughout the talk and then we'll go over them again. Um, algorithms, they come up in weird places. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of like really strange like textbook examples. Like, you know, you do like 
Dijkstra's algorithm and you say like, oh, I guess like maybe possibly Google Maps uses Dijkstra's algorithm to like find the shortest path to your destination and like that's your one textbook example. And it makes sense, <coughs> but I'm, I, I want to emphasize that like, you know it, it it can be it can it can come up in more non-obvious ways. You're not alone. When I was in university, I you know I, I had a lot of problem sets where I was just like sitting there like, at 2 a.m. by myself like doing a bunch of problems. And I was like pretty sad about it. Uh, and, and you know, there's like a bunch of anti-plagiarism rules, so like <laughs> you can't go and like ask your friend for help, right? Like I don't know what it's like at National University of Singapore, but like I'm sure you all have to like, like come up with the answer here by yourself. But at work, you get to collaborate. Like if you don't know the answer, first of all, you Google it, and then you like go read some research papers, and then you go and implement the thing. Or you ask your teammates, and they do code review, or they just like help you figure out the problem. Like there's a reason why the phrase like rubber duck debugging exists. Um, I actually find that a lot more exciting because, like, if I can't solve a problem, it's it's a lot more fun to just talk to someone about it instead of like sitting there alone, like hoping that I figure it out before the deadline. Time and space complexity. I'm sure you're all doing these like interviews where you're like, oh, big O, like, or it's gonna be like O of n complexity, like something like O of one space. That's cool and all, but like, it's not the end of the story. Um, sometimes if you're if n is like 20, you don't care what big O is. It could be like n squared, and you wouldn't care, right? Um, so actually, in this talk, we're going to be talking about a ton of different kinds of constraints or things that you could think you need to think about in the real world. Um, and similar to the previous point, uh, it's a lot more easy to understand the problem when there's an actual thing to be solved. Like there's a business need. Like you're saying, like if I don't solve this problem, maybe I will lose like a million dollars. <laughs> or um, if I can solve this problem but do it within like two, like make my software run within like two hours, then that's fine too. Like you don't have to make it run within like milliseconds. So once you know like what the business needs are and what the um, what the constraints of the problem are, uh, that makes it a lot easier to come up with a solution rather than like I don't know <laughs> coming over like a heap-based sorting algorithm. Blah blah blah. I'm just like throwing out words now. So those are the takeaways. We'll go over them again at the end. Today we're gonna go cover three different like stories about Stripe. I kind of cheated because I said I was going to go with three, but then I, number two, I put two. So we're going to go over four different stories, actually. Um, in this point, I, if, if I'm talking too fast, please just like, I guess, like wave at me or something. And also ask questions like throughout this. Like, I mean, just think of it as like a really friendly uh, college lecture or something. Just raise your hand and ask questions. So we're going to go rate limiting first. Um, what is rate limiting? There's two kinds of rate limiting. So first, you know, you can think about just limiting how many requests are coming in per second. Uh, for example, at Stripe, you know, we have a lot of merchants. They're all making requests to our API. Um, and you might just want to say uh, you can have like 1,000 requests per second. Uh, and then the other kind would be how many concurrent requests can you have. Uh, the difference here is like, let's say that you have, a, so you have someone who's like trying to like load up a page of all of their payments. And then they're staring at it. And then they're like, why won't it load? So they just keep refreshing the page. You don't actually want to spawn off a request for every single one of those because like, <laughs> that would, um, I mean, I guess that would just, if you have too much CPU, the server might crash and so on and so on. So these are two kinds of uh, rate of concurrent requests. And I, guess, I guess I want to take a minute to like, let you all think, like, well, how, like, how would you stop someone from making too many requests at a time between each of these? If you, if you already like, Googled this, then you might already know the answer, because that's how I found out. Yeah. So there's only two strategies. You can either throttle it in the house. So throttling just means that you sort of bash the request together such that if one request come in within some time limit, you you only like say maybe take the last one or you sort of do something such that you group them together. It's also debouncing, which is slightly different. It's usually used in user interface design instead where you all you if multiple requests come in within a certain period, you just keep on waiting until some long time has passed after the last request, and then you make the final request. Yeah. Well, you know what's awesome is both of those sound totally right. I'm going to repeat it just to uh, get it on the video, to be honest. Uh, so the first one you said was like batching. So like you wait like some amount of time. You take all requests. You process them all at once. Second one would be debouncing, where like you uh, kind of similar. I, I, I've only heard about it in the context of like you're, let's say you're doing like autocomplete, and then you're typing. So if I type out like I'm going to type out like Los Angeles, and I type L, then it, it'll like wait, and then if I type out Los Angeles, it'll only send like that one request. All right, awesome. Love both of those answers. Then we're going to talk about a third answer. Um, oh, oops. No, we're going to talk about why first. That's great. <laughs> I don't remember my own slides. OK, three reasons why you might want to rate limit. And just to like really drill in the point, uh, 
first of all, you care about uh, the impact of one user, and you can see that there's this like one evil cat that's not a mere cat. Uh, <laughs> so this, you know, it's not evil. It like to be to be clear, like, you know, there could be one malicious user. They might be trying to do like a DDoS on you. Or they actually might just be confused. Like they might have written a script that they thought was just going to run for a few minutes, and they, like, they're just like spamming your servers because they don't know how to stop the script on their own machines, or they don't even notice how many requests that they're sending. So th that's one. Second is you want to prioritize critical requests. So at Stripe, you know, you, you might have the API endpoint that's responsible for listing all of your payments. Not really that important. You have the one that's literally submitting payments. That one's extremely important. So you might want to load shed everything that's not important so that you can get the things that are important. Finally, you personally might be broken. <laughs> so if, this, if Stripe is degraded for some reason, like maybe like some, a bunch of our boxes are out of memory killing, then we might want to make sure that we are able to load shed everything that's not important so that we can stay up. And this cat is still trying to drink even though it's extremely confused. And that's why I like this gift so much. Sorry, so that was a di digression. So the, a totally different way to rate limit. All these are totally valid ideas. Uh, pretend like you have a bucket. We're going to call this the bucket token algorithm. It has a Wikipedia article, which is where I got a lot of this information from. Uh, so uh, consider every bucket like one of your merchants. And you can see how some of them are not completely filled. Uh, every couple of seconds, try adding a drop to each bucket that doesn't already, isn't already filled with water. So you can see that we are uh, going to slowly add water to all of them. And imagine there's no request coming in at all right now. Eventually, all the buckets will be filled. So Imagine that one of these buckets is already um, empty. You will just take away some of the water or some like token. You know, let's say you have 20 tokens, just take away one and then do the request. If they don't have any tokens, then they can't have a request. Uh, and you can see here, you know, they slowly deplete their own buckets. So it's it, I feel like it's a pretty like, intuitive like way of saying like oh, <laughs> you you can only have a thousand requests per second. If you took away too many, you got to wait for the next time that we add a drop to your bucket, and then you can have that request. So um, that's literally how Stripe does rate limiting. I will give you a fun fact, and then I'm going to uh, in definitely right after just tell our recruiting team that I told you this. But when I was interviewing at Stripe, the night before, they, were, they sent me this email that was like, hey, you know, make sure you like, do some research, like read our blog, check it out. And so I was like, okay, I'll go to Stripe.com, like blog and all that. And then top blog post was like, how Stripe does rate limiting. So I read the whole thing because I was like really, really like, excited about this job interview. I read the whole thing, clicked on the Wikipedia article, read about the buckets thing. Came in the next day and they were like, all right, you're gonna do rate limiting. And I was like, you know, your blog like literally tells you the answer like right now. Like I can just tell you exactly what I read last night. And they were like, we're gonna do a different problem now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like maybe that's how I got the job. So I don't know. Uh, it, it pays off to do your research on the companies that you're gonna interview at. Um, okay. Wait, actually, I, I guess I should stop. Is there any questions about rate limiting before I move on to a totally different topic? Uh, if you do start coming up with questions, I know it takes, sometimes it takes me a look. It takes me a few minutes sometimes to process and realize that I do have a question. Of course, just raise your hand at any point, and then we'll, we can ha take time at the end as well. Uh, compilers, one of my favorite classes in uh, no second favorite. I gotta like start rating the classes I liked in college. Uh, com so we have two different ways that we use like kind of a like cool compiler theory in school or in Stripe, which is not a school. Uh, so we have this thing called a, a sorbet, which is what is a static type checker for Ruby. So static meaning that it runs before uh, at compile, not compile time, but like runs at commit time before you uh, commit things to our code base. And what's really great about it is uh, it uses all these like really big fancy words that I had to learn in compilers class, so like ASTs and CFDs and DSLs. And then I had to go and like Google them before I came here because I didn't want to tell you all the wrong thing about what these words are. So abstract syntax, syntax tree, it's like you of course, you model the entire language and make sure you know like there's an if statement, there's a code block inside the if statement, there's the else statement, uh, and so on. The CFG, uh, oops, yeah, CFG I got on the previous one. A domain-specific language would be uh, kind of a language that's like specifically meant to do like one task as opposed to like C++, C++ Java, Ruby. Uh, in this case, the domain is type checking Ruby. Uh, and what, what I thought was kind of interesting is that most of our code base at Stripe is not written in C++. I think this might be the only project. And it's because, it, because performance actually mattered quite a bit for this one. And the reason why performance matters so much is that every single time like, a developer is uh, committing code and submitting it to our like, gigantic test suite, it matters. You don't want a developer to have to stay around for like, an hour every time they like, save their code. So 
uh, in this case, they actually wrote uh, quite a few optimizations to make sure it was running as fast as possible because it's a huge impact on developer productivity. So that's one time that uh, like all the time complexity matters. So I took this cool screenshot just in case you didn't uh, already know what abstracts and text tree is. Uh, I took this from one of my coworkers. Uh, you can imagine that we're modeling the language that way. Uh, and then I thought that this was like a somewhat, I almost felt like this was a contrived example because like how often are you going to write a type checker for a language? Like are you going to go off to your job and do that? No, ideally you would go and do this one if you were uh, writing Ruby. One that I thought was even more exciting was Radar, which is our fraud detection uh, system. We actually allow merchants to write out their own rules. For example, this one says block if the card is a prepaid card, if they're trying to charge over $1,000 and they're not in the United States. Um, and it actually tells you like, which, which charges would have uh, matched this rule. So we let people write out these like, uh, our own DSL or domain specific language for detecting fraud. We let people write out these rules and then we parse those rules. And then, uh, well, first of all, we have to return syntax errors to our users and we should parse it and then like run it against their own <coughs> transactions. So uh, that one we actually did write our own whole language it, uh, for, and it's pretty great. Um, yeah, so that's uh, a cool application of like all the compiler theory you're coming up with. It's, I feel like writing a parser for a language is actually a pretty common task, more common than I would have expected. I thought compilers were never going to come up. Um, I didn't put this in the slides, but even uh, like at my on my own team, I uh, earlier this year we had to write our own like compiler basically for converting the uh, objects from one of our vendors. Uh, object meaning like. The, the way that they were encoding uh, the data that we were sending them. We wrote a compiler for that so that we could parse it and then automatically uh, generate the data to, for another vendor. And we, so we wrote that compiler, we took all of our data, moved it to the other vendor, and then we saved ourselves a ton of money. So there's a ton of, ton, ton of reasons why you'd write a parser at work, it turns out. Yes? Um, do you use any sort of like parser generators or toolkits, or do you just hand roll? Oh yeah, we do use a couple of open source libraries for parsing and lexing and all those cool words. I actually don't know what the names of those open source libraries are <laughs> off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of really great tools out there for uh, writing your own file. Someone saying something? Huh? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, finally, I wanted to spend the most time on machine learning because I feel like this is the most, like, most important and most relevant, like the social side of everything you do. It's so important. I don't. Uh, I feel like there's a huge debate in the tech industry right now about how like you can get through a whole computer science degree without taking an ethics class. I don't know if that's true here, but at my school you could you could just graduate and like you wouldn't have to ever think about like the implications of what you are doing. Um, so it's, are are you all thinking about it now? Like, do you have to take an ethics class? Okay, I'm so glad. But please. Oh no! No! <laughs> oh. Even if it's not that good, please take it seriously. I, I, I mean, I think it's like one of the most important issues of our generation. Are we all good to keep going? Yeah, yes, okay. Um, so, why did my card get rejected? Huge question, merchants constantly wanna know, like a user was trying to make a purchase, we didn't let it go through, what the heck? Uh, and so, just to like frame what we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna first explain how Stripe, talks, how Stripe tells users why our machine learning algorithms reject them. So, decision trees. First of all, we like come up with a bunch of like, like pieces of information or features for like, why a charge would have, been, uh, would have gone rejected. So, you know, like, was the card issued in the United States and so on? Were there more charges in the last 30 minutes? You can imagine the features getting pretty um, fancy. You know, like how many IP addresses was the card used in in the last day? It wouldn't make sense if it was used, it was used all over the world, unless it was like a travel agency, maybe. I don't know. Um, and we use uh, some like statistical data that we already have to like, figure out like what the likelihood of fraud is. If you imagine we can like, make a gigantic decision tree and like make a decision at the end on like what percent we think the fraud is, and we can set a threshold on that. But that's that isn't quite sustainable. So actually, we take this and we do it a bajillion times. We have a bunch of different decision trees that are all coming up with different decisions based on the features that we gave it. So that's called a forest. I love it. Trees, forests. It's a great metaphor. Um, what we do with, at the end of all these decision trees is that we, we just average or just aggregate all of the decisions from all of these. And then at the end of it, that's when we figure out overwhelmingly like whether or not it was going to be fraud or not. <coughs> but the unfortunate thing about this uh, system is that you can't s explain to a user like what happened. You just say like, 
I don't know, we looked at the forest and the forest said that like maybe it was going to be fraudy. I don't know. So uh, <laughs> it's not a great user experience because we do want to be able to tell customers something, like w just why. So uh, here's what, where we were before. We um, had, it's it just, uh, sorry, I can't, I know you can't read it back there, but it says like, there are many contributing factors to the risk level of this payment based on activity across the Stripe network. Because you know, of course, we check. We don't use just that merchant's data. We use all of our merchant's data to, uh, to detect fraud. So we don't tell the merchant anything. Then, after we uh, used a, a new system for uh, explaining this, we actually said, "Oh, it was used from an unusually large number of IP addresses over the Stripe network." And so that's a much better explanation for why this happened. Um, so the way that we got here to this uh, second picture is we actually started using predicates. So uh, we've come up with a, co a couple of really short rules. Um, once, we, uh, once we made a decision from our gigantic machine learning model, we were running against those smaller predicates. And then the, the highest priority or most obvious one that um, the, uh, and by priority, I mean like the one that we think is like most important to sh share with the merchant. The first one that matches, like, you know, matches the same features as that charge, we'll use that one as our explanation. Um, so that's one way of doing it in a really fast performant way without like having to review our entire model. You can imagine that also like, if you could somehow explain the entire model, then fraudsters would just use our information to uh, continue to circumvent our systems. So that's why we don't, we always want to be, a, you know, just give like a two sentences. Don't give it like a whole essay of like what happened. So I wanted you all to feel uncomfortable. So I <laughs> did this Drake. So no, yes. And then I felt so bad for doing this that I was like, oh yeah, hello, fellow kids. I'm so old. I'm sorry for memeing you. OK, most important piece of this. Why did it really happen? Um, so let me give you an example. Let's say you walk into a bank, and you're like, can I have a loan? And they're like, uh, yeah, let's look at all this data. And the human is looking at it and thinking, like, they're thinking a ton of different things. But they tell you at the end of it, like, you don't have enough collateral. Then you're, then you're just sitting there thinking, like, is that really what happened? Um, let's say, for example, I was a person from a minority group. Or if I'm trying to get an apartment here in Singapore, like, it, did they did they really say it was because my income wasn't high enough, or is it because they just didn't want me to live there because like maybe there's some sort of racism there? All of those things can actually happen very much in machine learning. It can definitely get amplified, and so that's why uh, we actually do quite a bit of work to make sure that we try to keep our machine learning algorithms as fair as possible. So I'm, I want to explain what fairness means too. Uh, I, I saw some really great quotes from Peter Norvig. I really respect him. He's the director of, director of research at Google, and he's and he was kind of explaining this whole like, bank idea. Like you go in, they, they tell you a reason, but you don't know if that's what really was going through their head. You know, they, a lot of times people will just like, kind of jump to a conclusion, and you say why, and then they fish around and like, eventually justify something that was maybe more of a feeling. And the same thing can happen with machine learning. Uh, again, same thing. Thank, like, they might have been your skin color. It might have been your collateral. Who knows? Um, now, you're probably wondering, like, well, how, how, could, how could a machine learning algorithm be biased? Like, what does that even mean? Uh, for example, like Stripe doesn't know what race you are, so like, why would it, how could it be racist if it doesn't know what the race is? And the, the answer is actually that um, there's a ton of different factors. One really big way that you can unintentionally make a biased algorithm is by using features that are tightly correlated to features that you do not want to uh, be making decisions on. So if people from a certain uh, ethnic background all live in one neighborhood and you decide that like all, all charges from that neighborhood are fraudy, you're going to end up like rejecting a ton of uh, charges from that neighborhood. Um, I found this concept like pretty difficult to like, come, like to understand myself, to be honest, because I kept asking like, well, if there's a high rate of fraud, then why shouldn't you just say that there's a high rate of fraud? Uh, and actually, I, I will explain why, like how I kind of like came to terms with that myself. I, I'm not sure if that's like something you all are like working through right now. Like, Seriously, it's a, it's a complicated topic. I feel like I'm not giving it enough justice here. So uh, when I think about fairness, or when we start all think about fairness here, we're usually looking at rate of true positives and rate of false negatives. So for something to be fair, we do want to make sure that, like, let's say you, you, you are a good customer. You are uh, not committing fraud. You would, uh, you would hope that the pro probability of you getting marked as a good customer is equal regardless of uh, things like your gender, your background, your physical location. Um, and that's not always true. So you, know, you can imagine like a, 
good merchant in a bad neighborhood and a good merchant in a good neighborhood and if they have less like if they have different probability of like getting through our systems and that's unfair on the other end of uh, again same idea we don't want to disproportionately reject people or false negatives let me make sure i i always have to draw the table so let me <laughs> So not flagged fraud, right. So we don't want to uh, disproportionately allow, um, why, do, why do I feel like I wrote this table wrong? I went through it a lot of times. Did I do it wrong? No, not flagged and there are fraud. So yes, we said that they were not fraudy, but they were fraudy. I, 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 I'm glad I wrote the table out for myself. This is why I failed algorithms. <laughs> this is really why. <laughs> Luckily, in, in, when you're at work, you get like a couple of weeks to do things, and like in school, you get like a few minutes to do things, and that's probably the struggle. Uh, yeah, same idea with rate of false negatives. If the people, if people have different like probabilities of getting rejected by your system, then that would be also a problem. It's a heavy topic. Do you guys have any questions? Like, oh, it's difficult. Yeah, good. I used to be a teaching assistant. I can stare at you as long as. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then you're probably asking, like, well, can't you just like not be racist? I don't know. Like, isn't that real easy? Uh, <laughs> I mean, sometimes I wonder, like, why, why can't we just fix it? So there's a ton of reasons. Actually, it's a pretty hard problem. So first of all, there's like the complexity. You know, we just went through like really quickly. We just went through the whole like decision forest thing. Like, how are you going to go and like re reduce bias from that? How are you going to make a performance system that can like synchronously block a charge as soon as it comes in on the API while also like mi mitigating bias? Uh, the user experience, you know, you, I remember what I was going to say for this. Yeah, we, you might want to start collecting a ton of data about your users in order to like, figure out whether or not your system is biased. When you sign up for Stripe, we don't like ask you about any of your uh, demographic information because that would be incredibly, like, possibly illegal and also like really uncomfortable for the user. So, uh, e for example, we ha we do have a, a product called Stripe Atlas where we um, we allow people to incorporate companies in the United States even if they don't live in the United States. We don't collect gender. And at some point, someone was like, shouldn't we figure out if like women are disproportionately not starting companies? And it was like, well, that's a good question. Too bad we can't do anything about that because we can't collect gender. Um, we can have people opt in to, do, to give that information, but that's not the same as just collecting it. So the user experience side, like there's the legal, the regulatory, and like just creeping out your users side of it. You don't want to ask them weird questions. Um, then there's the cost. And what I mean here is that uh, and prioritization where Let's say you really, really care about this and you have some sort of pressure to also finish your deadlines. Uh, you know, you want to launch, the, launch that new product and you're kind of thinking like, oh, like maybe, the, maybe the algorithm is like a little bit racist, but like I can just like push it over the line and like make, make a ton of money. So like there's, like there are different um, priorities that are being rewarded sometimes. And like, just to give some examples, you know, like when you're trying to, if you're trying to optimize for growth or number of users, you might willfully not notice that a ton of your users are bots. Same thing happens here. There's a ton of reasons why, like beyond just like wanting to do the right thing where you might just not notice that you're, there's something going on underneath. So I do want to emphasize that like, you know, we should have some empathy for the people who are writing all these algorithms. I'm sure that they're thinking about it, but there's just a ton of other things going on at the same time. There is actually a cool website. You can Google uh, FATML. Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in Machine Learning. They do a, a conference every single year. They, do, they have a ton of research papers. It's a really great community for talking about uh, fairness in machine learning. Um, there's a ton of really, like, even more research that you could be doing. Um, the, for example, GDPR, I think people are still figuring out right now. Oh, I should explain what GDPR is, the General Data Privacy Regulation. I hope people are nodding because I said the right words. Uh, so you in the European Union, you have a ton of ton more rights around what what people do with your data. So with GDPR, um, there's actually a right to an explanation. People haven't really figured out legally like, what this means, but that does mean that increasingly in the EU, we might be required to start giving people explanations for why machine learning algorithms gave decisions for what like what we decided on them. So it's a really like, growing. Oh yeah, do you have a question? How do I get the truth values for the fraud cases in the decision tree? So we, uh, so we actually like you know we do get some training sets. So for example, we like 
a human says like tw these 12 were fraudulent, these 300 were legitimate, then we use that to uh, figure out what features like would have led to that probability. Which actually is like kind of interesting because that means like a human seeded this data, which is also another source of bias. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so, got see the Drake meme again. That's great. Um, okay, so I will close out this uh, machine learning discussion with like my favorite Harry Potter quote. Uh, it, you, I don't know if you all read like Harry Potter too, but he's like, Jenny, haven't I taught you anything? What have I always told you? Never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. You can't see where machine learning keeps its brain. You have no idea what decisions it's making. And so it's really easy to just like jump to conclusions that like, Marco Tano thinks is fr like, fraudulent when like, it might just be perpetuating the kinds of biases that we already have in our uh, society. OK, so again, I, I told you all I was going to go over the takeaways from the beginning. Unexpected, <laughs> algorithms are unexpected and also it's strange how, like in the in the real world, you know, you you think that's going to be all is like extreme math. I can see the whiteboards here. It's like a bunch of graphs, a bunch of like like there's a literally like eight step algorithm right here. I thought that was really funny. It's not like that. <laughs> you do have to make a lot of like business related decisions and also like figure out some like pretty hard problems. And you're not alone. You know, you're not like sitting here writing on a whiteboard by yourself. Um, and you know, time and space complexity. That's just like the very beginning of it. But then you do have to think about a lot of like the real world repercussions of the things that you're building. So I hope that was a lot of fun. I, I thought it was pretty exciting. Um, Stripe does a ton of uh, this type of work. I, I think people like, really like talking about like, these deep and complicated issues. Um, I feel like I 